Okay, this video is to help you out with your notes on antibody production and vaccination. Okay, so before we get into anything crazy, let's do a little bit of a review of the immune system. Okay, your immune system can only recognize other cells as being self or not self. Like, do they belong there or are they from an outside source? Okay, so it can't distinguish between things that cause diseases and things that don't, okay? So it doesn't know if whatever this non-self thing is harmful or not. It just knows that it doesn't belong there. So since all of your cells contain identical DNA, they all produce a particular version of a membrane protein. So remember that jet rat, okay, um, mnemonic device, Okay, so this recognition part um, kind of belongs here. So all the cells in your body have some version of a membrane protein that your immune system can use to recognize as to whether it belongs in your body or not. Okay, so let's consider a scenario where you've lost a massive amount of blood, you've cut your leg off accidentally, I don't know how, but I'm already mad at you, and your awkwardly old lab partner offers to give you some blood. So what are some questions that we should ask first? Uh, other than the obvious, why are you old and what happened to my leg? Um, I would think that one of the things that you'd want to know of uh, is what is your blood type? And really, why does that matter? So your blood type specifically corresponds to your red blood cells, your erythrocytes. And without getting into Rh positives and negatives, we have one, two, three, four blood types, depending on the patterns of the membrane proteins found on their surface. So type O blood has no membrane proteins. Type A has one type of membrane protein type B has a different type, and type AB blood has both the type A and the type B proteins. Let's say that you have type A blood, so this is you. If you receive blood from a person with type B blood, those membrane proteins don't match, and your immune system is going to initiate a response and try to kill off all of these guys. So that's kind of useless. Okay, so what we wanna do is we wanna get blood that either is the same type, okay, so hold, let's hope my lab partner is type A blood, or I can get type O blood, it doesn't have any membrane proteins, my immune system won't even know that it's there. Okay, so the point here is, is that we have to get blood that has the same pattern of membrane proteins on the outside so our immune system knows that uh, they belong there, that it's okay. Okay, so enough about erythrocytes because they're not as cool in terms of immune capability. Okay, so we're gonna look at these leukocytes. So remember, site meaning cell, leuco meaning white. We're talking about our white blood cells. And we're gonna talk about three main types. So we've got our macrophages, our big eaters. Remember, we also call them phagocytic leukocytes. So cells that are white and ingest things via phagocytosis. We've got our helper T cells, and then we've got B cells, also known as B lymphocytes or plasma cells. So in a typical primary immune response, so primary meaning I'm encountering a pathogen for the very first time, you should already know that. These macrophages are going to encounter a cell and they're gonna recognize it as not self. So it starts with a macrophage, recognizes a cell that it doesn't belong there, it engulfs it via phagocytosis. So we can see that going on in here. Inside this macrophage are a bunch of lysosomes and those lysosomes are filled with enzymes that are going to partially digest those pathogens. Then this macrophage does something really strange. It takes that partially digested pathogen and it wears it on its outside like a true like Hannibal Lecter move. So some pieces of the pathogen are displayed on the cell membrane of the macrophage. And this is what we call antigen presentation. So it destroys it and then it wears it on its outside as kind of like an advertisement of, oh my gosh, look who's here, this is not good news. 
So then these helper T cells come along and they're kind of feeling up on these macrophages and they're gonna recognize that antigen and they're gonna become activated. Now those helper T cells are exactly what they sound like. They're just helpers. So once the helper T cells figure out what pathogen that might be, they're going to run around and find and activate the type of B cell that they know that can uh, produce that specific antibody. So we've got thousands of different B cells. That helper T cell is running around trying to figure out which one can make that kind of antibody. Once it finds the right B cell, it's going to activate it, and then that B cell is going to clone itself many, many, many times, make a lot of itself. From here, one of two things is gonna happen. That clone B cell is either gonna become a plasma cell, which is what's gonna produce the antibodies, or it's gonna become like this long-lived memory cell, which is gonna remain in the bloodstream to kind of like prepare for the next invasion. So these plasma cells that produce antibodies, okay, we have to remember that what they're producing is a protein. So we would expect them to have lots of ribosomes, rough ERs, et cetera. These antibodies are always Y-shaped proteins, and they have a particularly shaped binding site that will only bind with one antigen. So again, they're like a lock and a key. But what's really cool about these things is because they're Y-shaped, they can actually bind to two antigens, not two different ones, but two antigens that are the same. And so what that allows them to do is to kind of create this network where because they're sticking to more than one, it finds a bunch of antigens and then it kind of helps to clump them all together. And that's one of the ways that antibodies help to function in our immune response. So the first thing that they do is they're, they're clumping those antigens together, which makes it a lot easier for these uh, phagocytic leukocytes okay, to come along and eat whole big globs of pathogens and antigens. Okay? The other thing that it can do is it can mark them for destruction from other cells, okay? So there are other cells in our immune system that we're not going to talk about. Um, and sometimes when those antibodies are sticking onto them, it can be like a billboard for other immune cells, um, an advertisement to come on over here and destroy these things. So we just finished talking about primary immune responses. So primary meaning your first exposure to something. So we talked about antigen presentation by the macrophages, T cell and B cell activation, and B cell cloning. This might take a while, okay? This can take uh, a week or more. And so while this is going on, whoever has this disease is going to be experiencing symptoms. So during this primary infection, this is normally when we get our worst symptoms. This, by the way, is uh, syphilis. Um, it look, looks a little different than I bet you thought it would, okay? But syphilis is not just a problem in your pants. It can be a problem in your entire body. Just a little FYI. Now, after our primary immune response, if we get the same pathogen, okay, that tries to invade a second time, third time, 27th time, okay, we're going to get a much faster response, okay? And that's because we already have memory cells floating around in our bloodstream that are rocking and ready to go, okay, ready to produce those antibodies. So if that invades a second time, we might not even know it. We might not even experience any symptoms because these guys are producing antibodies and killing that infection off so quickly that we never know that it's even there to begin with. Okay, so I want to take a look at how our antibody concentration okay, changes over time okay, in response to primary and secondary infections. So I'm gonna start with the first exposure to our pathogen, okay? So we're talking about our primary exposure. That's gonna cause our antibodies to slowly increase over time, okay? Once we've fought off that uh, pathogen, we don't need as many antibodies in our bloodstream, so those antibodies are gonna go back down, okay? And so this is what we call a primary response. Okay. 
Okay. Now, let's say we get a second exposure at another point in time. What's going to happen is that we're not only going to get a greater response in terms of antibody production, but we're also going to take less amount of time to do that, okay? And it's going to fight off that infection really quickly. And so this is what we call a secondary response. Okay, so we have to remember that immunity is established after we've had an experience with a pathogen. So you first have to be exposed to a pathogen. And I'm sorry, that's just the way that it works. Okay, but what if I have a disease that I don't want to experience the symptoms, like let's say chickenpox. I can then ask for the chickenpox vaccine. Okay, so vaccines are a way of exposing a person to a pathogen for the first time, like we're getting this primary exposure done and over with, but in a way that they don't really experience any symptoms. Okay, so vaccines, they usually alter the form of the pathogen so that it doesn't cause any symptoms, but what it does is it gives you this primary immune response. So here's my vaccine. Okay, it gets that primary immune response out of the way with no symptoms. Okay, and so then what's going to happen is that chicken pox is going to try to invade my body. Okay, but lucky for me, I'm ready to go with this secondary immune response. So when it invades again, okay, I have enough antibodies to fight that off quickly without experiencing any symptoms. It doesn't prevent infections, okay? It doesn't work like that. You don't have some kind of magical chicken pox bag over you. What it does is, again, make sure that you already have those memory cells in your blood from the primary immune response that we got from the vaccine so that any other time you're exposed to that virus, you're capable of producing those antibodies without any symptoms. So where do we get our immunity from? Okay, well, there's two basic types of immunity. So we have passive immunity, and this is pretty cool. This is when one organism produces antibodies for another organism to use, okay? So trading for some antibodies on the black market. Then we've got active immunity, and an active immunity is producing your own antibodies, but remember, in order to do that, we have to experience a primary immune response. So let's take a look at these examples down here. I'm going to do the one at the bottom first. So the bottom one says, a newborn receives antibodies in the colostrum, which is that first breast milk. Okay, so if I'm getting or antibodies from another organism, that's going to be passive immunity. In this second example, a child is given an MMR, measles, mumps, and rubella vaccine. Okay, well, vaccines are just something that are going to help elicit a, your own primary immune response, and then you're going to be making your own antibodies. So vaccines are a way of getting active immunity. They're not giving us the antibodies. They're giving us the ability to produce them. All right, so let's move on to start talking about not the spread of antibodies, but the spread of diseases, okay? So we know that within a species, like John can give the cold to Mary, okay? Within a species, it's no problem. But passing from one species to another uh, is actually really tough. So when we think about some classic diseases that have been passed from one species to another, some common examples come to mind like salmonella, tuberculosis, ringworm, okay? These are all bacterial and fungal diseases, okay? So bacteria and fungi aren't as picky. We'll talk about why in a minute. You're going to notice that very few of these are rarely viruses, okay? So viruses find it very difficult to jump from one species to another, and that's because viruses are tricky little buggers. So viruses have to have a binding site that matches a receptor on a host cell. They're no dummies. They want to make sure that when they inject their DNA into the host cell, that it's a host cell that's going to produce the DNA the way, or new baby viruses in the way that it wants to. So it's only going to bind somewhere if it has that matching receptor. Well, if this is a pig, 
okay? And this is a virus that knows how to infect pigs. The probability of a snake having the same shaped receptor is not very good. Of course, there are um, a couple of notable exceptions, right? So some things that have been in the news a lot lately, like H1N1, which is a swine flu, SARS, Ebola, HIV, AIDS, we think came from other members uh, of the primates. Um, but you have to remember that a lot of things have to be really perfect in order for this to happen. Whatever species has the receptor that the virus likes, the species that that viral disease can jump to has to have a very similar receptor, okay? Or maybe this virus mutated slightly and now it's able to bind with a slightly different receptor, okay? But it's likely that we're closely related to whoever we're getting these diseases from because these protein receptors uh, have to be similar for the viruses to bind there. Okay, so we talked a lot about how each B cell can produce a different type of antibody. So when the activated T helper cell finds the right B cell, okay, none of these other ones um, start to clone themselves, only this one, okay, only the one with the capability to produce the right antibodies. Well, this B cell is no dummy. It's kind of a jack of all trades. It actually produces several different versions of the antibody just to make sure that it's going to produce the right one. So it's going to produce several different, slightly different versions of those antibodies. And this is what we call a polyclonal immune response. So poly meaning many. So there's going to be several types of antibodies in there. If we want to try to isolate one of those antibodies, uh, it can be kind of tough. They're kind of hard to separate. They are soluble proteins, so they're in solution. It's kind of tough. So let's say I want to purify my sample of antibodies. I want to produce a monoclonal antibody, so many copies of one particular type of antibody. Well, here's how I would go about doing it. I'm first going to find some poor mouse, sorry mouse, not your lucky day, and I'm going to inject it with that specific antigen, okay? Not a pathogen. Pathogens often have many antigens on their surface, okay? I want a specific antibody, so that means I'm going to want the specific antigen, not the pathogen, Okay, so then the mouse is going to get sick and the mouse is going to have a primary immune response. Okay, we're going to take some of those B cells that are starting to copy themselves in, pre in preparation to make all those antibodies and we're going to harvest them. So we're going to make the mouse sick so that we can get <laughs> its uh, B cells out of there. Then we do something really cool. We fuse those B cells with myeloma cells, okay? And myelomas are a type of cancer, and when I fuse these B cells with the myeloma cells, I get something called a hybridoma, okay? Hybrid, more than one cell, oma, still referring to this cancerous cell. And I chose cancer cells, well, I didn't invent this, but someone chose cancer cells uh, because these cells live a long time and they're dividing rapidly. So if I wanna produce a lot of antibodies, um, I want a cell that's going to copy, 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 copy itself a whole bunch, and we know that cancer cells are particularly good at that. Okay, so I'm going to then separate, okay, these hybridoma cells from cells that didn't work, okay, and I'm going to allow them to replicate. Then I'm going to put them through something called an ELISA test, okay, and an ELISA test is a um, protein assay that's going to make sure that the antibody that I want is what's being produced. So you don't need to know the details of an ELISA test. You just need to know that it's a way of double checking that you're making the right protein. And then I'm going to be able to remove the antibodies from the cell culture. Okay. And since those all came from one pathogen, not sorry, one antigen, okay, I can be sure that they are all of one type and not several types. Okay, so again, just to review, mouse, sick, primary immune response, 
creates B cells. We get them out of the mouse. We fuse them with tumor cells. I get a hybridoma. Hybridomas copy, 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 copy. I put them through an ELISA test, and then I take out all of those antibodies. They should all be the same, okay? And that's what we call a monoclonal antibody. Now, oddly enough, monoclonal antibodies are what we actually use to diagnose pregnancy. Okay, so when a woman is pregnant, she's going to secrete a hormone called HCG. We'll learn about that later, but human chorionic gonadotropin. Okay, so this um, HCG, when it binds with a particular antibody, causes a color change. So what we do is we use that mouse hybridoma monoclonal antibody production to produce the antibody that combines with a uh, HCG, and we put that in the pregnancy test. That way, when the woman pees on the stick, if any of this HCG is in there, it will cause um, a reaction between this antibody and will cause a color change. Okay, so if there's no HCG present, we won't get a color change. Okay, it's an indicator that pregnancy uh, isn't what's going on. So pretty cool there. Now, what's not really cool is when our immune response freaks out when it's not supposed to, okay? And this is what we call an allergy. And some of you are like me, um, and you're very familiar with what this, is, uh, what this is like. So we have to remember that our immune response, our immune cells, can only recognize things as self or not self. They don't know if that not self thing is harmful or not. So sometimes things enter our bloodstream that don't belong there, but you know what? They're not harmful. Pollen, peanuts, eggs, bee venom, okay? So they're things that are not self, but they're also not harmful. And most people, okay, just kind of say, eh, all right, I'm going to ignore that. However, sometimes the immune response can have a, res uh, a reaction to these non-pathogens, and this is what we call an allergic response. So it's an immune response to a not-self cell, okay, that just happens to not be a pathogen. Okay, so if you experience an allergic response, here's what's happening here, okay? Your immune system is producing antibodies in response to some kind of non-self cell, okay, some kind of antigen, maybe peanuts, okay, maybe pollen, etc. But these dumb antibodies, instead of binding to the antigens, bind to these cells called mast cells, okay, so you need to remember that, mast cells. Then what happens is that once these antibodies are bound to the mast cell, some of these antigens, pollen, etc., will bind here. And when that binding happens, okay, it causes these mast cells to release some gnarly stuff called histamine. Histamine is the worst. Histamine causes our allergy symptoms, runny nose, itching, swelling, hives, throat swelling up, all kinds of bad things. And that's why if you look on a lot of allergy medicine, you're going to see that it says antihistamine. So this antihistamine kind of counteracts the um, symptoms of this histamine. It doesn't prevent your body from having an allergic response necessarily, but it takes care of some of these um, histamines that are released there. Okay, so again, let's draw this out. So we have our B cell our B plasma cell. There's no way I'm fitting the word plasma in there. Okay, and then I have some kind of allergen. Okay, and that allergen, I promise that says allergen, is gonna bind to that B cell. Okay, so that B cell, I'm just gonna write B, this is ridiculous, is going to produce lots of these Y-shaped antibodies. Okay, those antibodies are going to travel to these mast cells, okay? And they're going to bind to these mast cells, okay? So then, okay, when the mast cells, now they have all these antibodies on them, and I'm just gonna abbreviate M, hopefully your diagram looks better than mine, holy bananas. Okay, these mast cells, when they encounter the allergen, 
that allergen is going to bind to these antibodies because they have those proper receptor sites, okay? And then that's going to release histamine, okay? So the histamine actually comes from these mast cells. And this is how we get sneezing, itchy skin, watery eyes, okay, swelling, all that fun stuff. Okay, so apparently you have some kind of terribly irresponsible biology teacher, and another unfortunate event has occurred, and you've been bitten by the venomous class pet snake. Okay, so what are you going to do? Well, first of all, okay, snake poisons work in a variety of ways. Don't suck out the snake poison. That's just weird, and it doesn't work, okay? And I doubt you have any friends that like you enough to do that anyways. So what you're going to do is you're going to apply a tourniquet, so you tie off that limb with like a tight rope or a belt or something, and you want to keep your heart rate low so that the poison doesn't spread to the rest of your body. And then don't be a dummy. Go to the hospital. Be sure first to take a picture of the snake because when you get to the hospital and you ask them for an anti-venom shot, they're going to need to know which type of snake it was because these anti-venoms are specific to each type of snake. Okay, so tourniquet, picture, hospital. Okay, so hopefully before you get to the hospital, they've purchased some antivenom, and here's how antivenom is made. So we're going to take some of this snake's venom. I don't know how you get one of these jobs, but that seems awful, okay? And we're going to inject a very small amount into an animal. Sucks to be an animal, I'm really sorry. We're not gonna inject a lot, just a little bit, okay? And we're gonna let that animal have a primary immune response. And so that animal is gonna be producing antibodies. We're gonna take the antibodies from that animal and we're going to purify them and use them to make antivenom. So when we get antivenom, which hopefully you never have to get, that antivenom is really just a bunch of antibodies that will counteract the venom in the snake. And we get that by stealing them from animals here. Okay, so let's go back and reconsider this. So a man is injected with antivenom after being bitten by a poisonous snake. Is that passive or active immunity? Well, you didn't make, that man didn't make those antibodies. So that should be an example of passive immunity. One organism, in that case a horse, producing antibodies for another organism to use. Thank you, horse. Okay, so how do we know all of this? How do we know this is going to work? How do I know vaccines are going to work? Okay, well, I want to tell you a fantastic tale about one of the craziest scientists I wish I would have met, and his name was Edward Jenner, okay? And he did his work back in the late 1700s, and um, back then and really up until um, the early 1900s, smallpox was a relatively common yet ridiculously disgusting and deadly viral disease, okay? And so people with smallpox had these pus filled blisters all over their body. Uh, it had a high mortality rate, very bad, not something that you'd want to get. But what Jenner noticed was that milkmaids, okay, cow milkers, never got this disease, okay? So he wondered if there was some kind of relationship between cowpox, which cows can get and it kind of presents in the same kind of way, and the fact that these milk maidens never got smallpox. I don't know how he figured that out. I'm pretty sure he had some kind of milk maiden fetish and was stalking a lot of them, but he's not around for me to ask. So we'll just go with the fact that maybe he's really observant. Now comes the really weird part. So Edward Jenner took some of the pus from a cowpox pustule and he found some unsuspecting eight-year-old boy who apparently doesn't have a mother that looks after him, but more on that later. He took that pus, put it in the arm of a healthy eight-year-old boy, okay? And he's like, wow, that's great. The boy didn't die. Okay, so that's passing the first test. Great, okay? Then he figured out that boy didn't get cowpox either. Huh, so I just put cowpox into a boy. He didn't die or get cowpox. 
hmm, I'm going to continue doing this. And he started to find lots and lots of children. Um, and he put this cowpox pus into them. And what he noticed is that these children never got the similar disease called smallpox. Okay, so they became immune to the symptoms of this smallpox thing. Okay, so again, this had to have worked because the cowpox virus must have a similar receptor or sim similar antigen to smallpox. That way, the primary immune response that we got when we were injecting cowpox produced antibodies that worked when we were exposed to smallpox. Um, would this kind of scientific research be allowed today? I'm going to go ahead and say no. Um, we can't just run around injecting children with deadly viruses and hoping that they don't die or get diseases, okay? So it doesn't really work that way. But um, sometimes in history, we've noticed that things that are maybe ethically questionable sometimes can end up saving millions of lives. And so um, we use this research to develop the smallpox vaccine and saved um, millions of people from that terrible disease. Now, my parents got the smallpox vaccine, but I'm young and wonderful, and you and I, we're too young to get that. We never even got the smallpox vaccine. Well, why? Well, it's not because our government doesn't love us. They don't want us to have smallpox, okay? But we don't need the vaccine because smallpox has been eradicated, okay? And eradicated means there's been no confirmed cases of smallpox on the earth. So, so many people got vaccinated um, that the, that virus wasn't able to replicate and spread and it just kind of died out. So we don't need a disease or we don't need a vaccine for a disease that doesn't exist anymore. So that's kind of a cool thing. Or so we think, right? So there are a few countries that are storing some samples of the smallpox virus, okay? Um, and it's been found in a couple of places that this smallpox virus is in storage, Okay, so I want you to think about like why maybe they're doing this and do you think they should be doing this and why or why not? Okay, and then when you're done with that, um, here's a little bit of data on some morbidity. Okay, morbidity means they're dying, okay, in the pre-vaccine era. So here's some um, data on some common diseases. And then most recent reports of cases in the U.S., okay? So I want you to take a look at this data and tell me what kind of assumptions we can make based on this stuff. And that'll do it for Chapter 11.1. .1.